year, in 2017, at least 207 people were murdered because they protect the environment. In 2012, one of the people who was killed because they stood up to protect land and forests was a Cambodian environmentalist, Chuk Boutique, whom I knew and was filming for a documentary. At gunpoint, in Freilong Forest, it was fear that made me realise I wasn't removed from the situation. I could be killed because of what I was doing. As a filmmaker and as an academic, I wasn't, after all, an independent observer. Standing next to a famous forest activist as he was thrown to the ground in front of me, I was shaking too much to turn on my camera. But I held it out as if filming, knowing that witnessing the soldiers' actions might help stop them becoming murderers. I am still unpacking the realizations that arrived in a rush in those moments. One was what it means to live with freedom. What do you risk and might lose if, like Chuck Viti, you decide to confront terror? But also, what you can gain navigating hope under the eyes of powerful adversaries. Moments earlier, as we saw the soldiers arrive and come towards us across the clearing, the T said, I wonder if I should run away. I had already stood up to get out of there, or at least to get closer to the crowd of community defenders about 100 metres away behind us. But the T stayed sitting down. He said, where would I go? I'd like to see what they do. His decision was a bold denial of the utility of obeying fear. So long as he kept confronting the loggers, challenging powerful vested interests, going up against his opponents, he would always face death threats. I knew that there had been assassination attempts against him before, so I sat back down next to him, feeling anxious. Viti knew his rights, and that day, as usual, he had a printed copy of the Cambodian Constitution in his bag. But more than that, his decision to stay sitting down as we saw the soldiers coming was almost forcing them to either back down or do their worst. When the soldiers attacked, I looked up and see the, saw the guns. I couldn't think of anything in those moments except what was in front of me. I had no idea of what was to come. I didn't know that five months later, he would be killed, or the impact that would have on my life. All I could see or think was what I was seeing in front of me as I pretended to film. When I looked up and saw the guns, I jumped backwards, out of the way, and at that same moment, the community activists came up from behind us, some of them putting their unprotected bodies between Chippati and the guns. They pulled him out of danger. The next morning, I interviewed Viti, and I asked him, why do you keep doing this work when you know it is so dangerous? And he said, if I don't do this, no one would. People are too afraid, so I have to keep going. But if there's anything more strange and awe-inspiring than, than meeting someone who is putting their life on the line for what they believe, it is finding years later that they're not alone in that conviction. Courage breeds courage. Fear is catching, but bravery is just as infectious. And the more people catch it, the greater the chance of an epidemic. In 2013, a group of young activists formed an organization called Mother Nature Cambodia. Their first campaign was to save the Ereng Valley from hydropower development. By building a huge Facebook following, sustained media support, political adherence, and by creating a roadblock with the community, they finally won the campaign. That valley, which is not far from the place where Chuk Buti was killed a year before, 
is now still home to endangered Siamese crocodiles, a beautiful, clear river, a diversity of birds, and the indigenous people who live there. <coughs> One of the Mother Nature activists is San Milan. Their next campaign was to stop destructive sand dredging in Cambodia's southwest shores. Ships were going and scooping up millions of tons of sand and transporting it to Singapore. And since 2008, when the dredging started, the local communities dependent on the estuaries had seen their fish catch drop 70 to 80 percent. The mangrove forests were literally collapsing into the sea. Propelled by the energy of the local community, the Mother Nature activists took direct action. Milan and two of his fellow compatriots boarded the ships and demanded that they stop the dredging. A few days later, they received a summons to meet the local authorities. Milan said when he got the summons, at first he wasn't afraid, because during the dam campaign, they had also been arrested for a short time. He said when he reached the police station and they were handcuffed, he still wasn't afraid. They got to the gates of the prison. He wasn't afraid. And then they entered the cell. He said, at that moment, I was terrified. In jail, the air stank. There wasn't enough room to lie flat at night to sleep with up to 20 others in the cell. The food was inedible. When Malar came out, finally, over ten and a half months later, he was thin and could easily have been scared into submission. But he was even more determined to continue his activism. At lunch one day in a Thai restaurant, I asked him, do you feel as if when you take every step forward, confronting your fear, that fear retreats? He said, yes. He said, for me, before I went to jail, it was like standing on the edge of a cliff, looking down. But at the bottom, it's not rocks, it's water. And then I was falling, and then I had to swim. And now, when I think about the worst that might happen, I don't feel so afraid because I've been in the water. After Milan's release, the campaign continued and finally succeeded with a series of viral videos. Those videos exposed the mismatch in Cambodian records of sand, which indicated corruption to the scale of hundreds of millions of US dollars. The Singaporean government decided they had to stop buying Cambodian sand, and the Cambodian government followed up with a sand export ban. Last year, in Cambodia, the government dissolved the opposition party. Many human rights defenders and political opponents were thrown into jail. Free media outlets were abolished. In this context, two more Mother Nature activists were jailed. We decided it was far too dangerous for the activists to show their faces on these videos. And we decided to start making them with puppets instead to present this sensitive information. But those videos didn't get the same response. The activists explained it. They said, it's our courage that makes people interested. That's why they share these videos millions of times. It's because we're young and vulnerable and going up against powerful aggressors. One of the activists who recently came out of jail earlier this year said, he was willing to stand up. He wanted to show his face. And if it meant going back to jail, he would. He was ready. When Chip Petit decided to let the soldiers come towards him, he made that same choice. This is what is remarkable about environmental activists. They're constantly choosing what looks like the worst option, not to back down, to confront fear. On the other side of the world, in Pará State, in Brazil, Maria do Espírito Santo and her husband, Zé Claudio, knew that they were likely to be killed because they were protecting their forests. Before her death, Maria explained her decision to keep up the struggle. 
She said, I would be lying if I said I wasn't afraid. There are people saying to me, it's not worth it. But to me, it is worth it. Last year, a moment in the mangrove forest helped me to understand that choice. We organized a festival so that young people, students, and the general public could come and see this place that the Mother Nature activists sacrificed so much to protect and which is so beautiful. One night, our hosts invited us out on their fishing boat and they took us into the estuary. We glided to the two twin islands, Koh Bong, Koh Oum. As we got out of the boat into the warm, shallow water, Everywhere, the water lit up with phosphorescence. Beside me, in the mangroves, there were fireflies dancing. And when I looked up, the sky was deep and full of stars. I was struck with joy and amazement. I am alive and one part of this beautiful, living, sparkling planet that is our home. The next day, on the sand, there were games and a dance party, and Malau was in his element, among the islands that he had experienced and sacrificed so much to defend. I could see on his face, it was worth it. But, no one should have to make that choice, to risk their life or their freedom, to defend the environment that sustains all of us, and that we are all part of. From 2015 through 2017, environmental defenders were killed in and around the world's great intact forests. These are the forests that produce and clean the air we breathe, that contain the great repositories of terrestrial biodiversity, that absorb carbon, and that are integral to the identities and culture of many indigenous peoples. These are the forests that agribusinesses, loggers, criminal gangs, mining companies, and the supply chains that they support are destroying. What can we do? Being close to Chukwuti and the Mother Nature activists and other frontline environmental defenders led me to set up an organization, a campaign group called Not One More, with two colleagues. We're working with frontline defenders to support them in their work and with a broad community of organizations to address this crisis in violence. As a global community, we need to set ourselves against the collusion of government agencies with the corporations that profit from nature by destroying it. We also need to set ourselves against the centuries of oppression that run back through capitalism and colonialism and feudalism. Our generation doesn't have to repeat those patterns. We have the benefits of technology that brings us closer together and reminds us that the planet is our neighborhood. We have the legacy of powerful social movements, the lessons of history, and global awareness of the importance of the climate and the environment. We have indigenous people's articulation of our interconnectedness with the natural world. And simply, there is no reason we shouldn't decide to take action. Practically speaking, we have to get our pensions, state-funded investments, and all capital that we can influence out of environmentally destructive projects. And we need an audacious initiative led by and tailored to the needs of frontline environmental defenders to give them security support, legal advice, funding and advocacy support, and to help them with equipment and all their daily needs in their work. Last week, in the Gambia, two people, Abraima Ba and Bakari Mujabi were killed defending their community's land from sand mining. This week, this talk is dedicated to them and to all of the people, including you, who confront fear, whether that is great or small, 
to defend our love. Thank you.